Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to episode 13 I believe of the Footmarks podcast and it is called Man Like Mankad. So you have me, your host Bairam Kazi, you can find me at Def Mango on Twitter and with me of course is Jared Kimber who you can find everywhere. So Jared, Vinu Mankad. Now in your piece, I love the way you started it. You said that before he was, well he started off as a proper noun, then he was a noun and then he was a verb. But before all of that stuff, he was a cricketer. And when you look at just his batting exploits, right, you look at this guy who, when he retired, was India's fourth highest run scorer. And this Mm. is a hard-hitting all-rounder. He's not primarily a batter, right? And then he still, to this date, has the second highest opening partnership in Test cricket history, which is 413 runs with Pankaj Roy. And he has 208 attempts versus Australia, and not just any Australia, Don Bradman's Australia, which went on in a couple of years to become the Invincibles. So talk to me about this man. I think that was the year he played them. Yeah. Yeah, it was 1947-48, right? So around about the same time. So this is also a guy who batted all 11 spots in Test cricket. And he's only one of three cricketers to do that. And what's more interesting is that, you know, as opener, he averaged 40. And then everywhere else, he was only half as good. So he ended up with an average of about 32, which is also quite ridiculous. So just mm. talk to me about the man. Talk to me about Vinu Mankad, because there's so much more to this cricketer than just running someone out of the non-striker's end. Yeah, I think you, you need to understand, you need to have grown up in an era when a team was coming into Test cricket and they needed a player to stand up for them to understand mm. his full worth. So he streak. You know, Andy Flower, you know, Murley, those hmm. sorts of guys. Um, you know, they're, you know, one's an all-time legend, one's, a, you know, not far below. And the other one's more of that also-ran sort of player. When you look at He Streak's record, I don't think anyone goes, oh, he's one of the best players who ever played the game. But if you look at He Streak's record for Zimbabwe, hmm. and you see this a lot, you see this with early New Zealand cricketers, you see this with early Pakistan cricketers, um, certainly with early Indian cricketers and West Indian cricketers as well. There's, there's always this guy that sort of has these numbers that when you look back on him, you're like, oh, okay, average, just over 30 <laughs> with the ball and just over 30 with a bat. A bit of a bits and pieces player is what our modern minds think. Hmm. But you have to understand that when he was averaging over 30 with a bat, no one else was making any runs, hmm. right? He was a non-specialist batter scoring more runs than all the specialist batters, right? Hmm. When you look at his bowling average of 32, you have to remember that he took, was it, what did I work out in the piece? Was it 20% or 70%? 21% of, of all wickets that India had ever taken in test cricket at the time he retired. 21%, uh, more than one uh, fifth. That's a ridiculous amount, hmm. right? And so even if he doesn't have the numbers of, he didn't end up averaging 40 with the bat in test cricket or, hmm. you know, or averaging under 20 with the ball, you know, sort of figures that Jadeja might end up with, right? Hmm. What we know is that he was an incredible player who played well above um, his overall numbers and the impact that he had on Indian cricket was absolutely massive. And so while it may not always look like he was the best player at a casual look at his stats, as you Hmm. said, you know, the 400 run opening partnership, he took an eight for against um, England um, on the Hmm. first day of a test, I think at Chennai, Hmm. you know, all these different things that he had of, he kept getting better He played in all these different positions. He did exactly what his team needed. Sort of the perfect, if you you want to go back, you know, I was talking about heat streak and everything. Think Trent Johnston, Hmm. right? You know, think those sorts of cricketers where you're just like, he did whatever his team needed on any particular time, at any particular time to make his team better. Despite the fact that he probably wasn't in the top five most talented players um, going around at that time. He just wheeled it because that's the kind of person he was. Yeah, no, absolutely. And a very, very big personality back in the day, very critical to India's early days and that test team. And just the fact, like you mentioned, you know, 21.3% of all of India's wickets in history at the time he retired, that's ridiculous. And also like just Vinu Mankad, the bowler, right? He might average 32 with the ball, which when you look at those figures, you're like, okay, that's not stellar. But this was a guy who was a great defensive bowler and his economy was only 2.12. And at the time that he retired, he had the seventh most wickets in test history. So mm. I think all of that comes out to, you know, paint a picture that this was a champion cricketer. Yeah, I, I actually, I looked up his economy home in a way as well, because he was so much better at home taking wickets. So I thought, well, maybe he like, had an economy rate of like one and a half at home, right? And then when he mm. went away, he got, he didn't. He had an economy rate at, at, away from home of 2.17. So mm. even when he traveled, no one actually made any uh, no one scored quickly off him at any time. So 
at worst case scenario, you travel away from home and you have a guy who has the ability to open the batting and give you really good defensive bowling, right? Hmm. That's the worst case he ever gives you. That's a, that's a really plus player. And we don't always think, you know, you and I, we've done this a lot now. And, you know, you, it's one of my hobby horses of talking about how we don't really value all-rounders the way that we should. But mm-hmm. the best way of looking at it is when India played, they went into every single match with an extra bowler if they wanted to because they had a bowler in their top order who had the ability to do that. And he made himself into that. So just a fantastic play. Yeah, I know, absolutely. So enough about Venu Mankat, the cricketer, for now. Let's jump into the fun stuff, the run out at the non-striker's end, which, of course, is named the Mankat. But it didn't start with him. If you go back, as you did in your piece, you have to go all the way back to the 1840s, which is nearly 200 years, you know, before 180-something years before. And you look at this guy called Thomas Parker. Like, Tomo, uh, well, he only played nine games, but he attempted five Munkards, which is ridiculous. Like, that is more than half a Munkard per game. And this guy also went on to become the first chair of Yorkshire County Cricket Club, which is quite staggering. So, my question to you is, why did we not call it the Barker or the Tomo? Why is it the Munkard? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I find that really interesting only because I don't think all of them are recorded, right? Hmm. So, I'm pretty sure that throughout the history, there have been some that were not recorded. I think there's... So Kane Williamson was man catted in a game in a list A game, and I think mm. that's not on everyone's database, but he certainly was. And and so I do think there are some that are missing. Mm. And yet all of Thomas Barker's are there. So mm. somewhere along the line, he was important enough figure that we p- people kept marking them down. Mm. And so then you go, well, wait a minute. I think he did all five of the first five because he'd finished his games by then. Surely. Mm. If it was going to be named after anyone, you would have thought it was him. But also, when we talk about it, his name just doesn't come up, right? Mm-hmm. And and I, I just found the whole thing really bizarre. You know, I, I always joke about this, that every time, every time one of us briefs, someone writes a new book about Yorkshire cricket, right? <laughs> and yet you have this guy who is really important to modern cricket in a way that most mm. Yorkshire... Some of the books that are written about old Yorkshire cricketers... You, they're, they're, they're not important. And that's not slagging mm-hmm. them off. Like, everyone goes out there, they put their body on the line, they play the game, etc. But they're not always important to the modern game. Well, Thomas mm. Barker quite actually is, right? Yeah. Because I don't think he invented this form of dismissal. Mm. But he certainly believed in it to a degree that no one else was. And the fact he goes on to chair Yorkshire. And he was a mm. very powerful gentleman. And I can tell you this for two reasons. One, he did five man cads and they kept letting him play. And two, he, he was the chairman of Yorkshire, but he was the chair of Yorkshire um, and he wasn't born in Yorkshire. And I don't know if mm. you know the full history of Yorkshire cricket, but they, don't even, they didn't even let people play for them if they worked from <laughs> Yorkshire, right? And, and so he obviously was a very well-respected person in his era. And then he did this incredible thing. And I feel like there should be an entire book written about just him and this run out. Yeah, no, Tommy B, definitely a pioneer. Maybe he didn't invent it, but at least that's the earliest record of the Munkard that you could find. Also, if you fast forward 20 years, Bill Hendley from New Zealand, he did the same. But when we come to the press and how they covered it, they had like, what, two lines on this? It wasn't given or paid much heed. They didn't really make much big of a deal out of this. And when you fast forward all the way to 1947-48, and I love the story and I'm going to narrate it because it's just that amazing. Bill Brown, you mentioned Bill Brown being critical to the story, of course, because he was an Australian cricketer, quite a very, like a very decent bat, Mm. who played on either side of the World War. Uh, Obviously, that impacted his game, but he was basically known as an elite runner between the wickets. And he himself refers to his game as tap and run. And on India or during India's tour of Australia in 47-48, in a tour game, when Bill Brown was stealing some ground, Vinu Mankad warned him. Next time, in the same game, he didn't warn him and he ran him out at the non-strikers end. Now, not that big a deal to a game. But then the second test in Sydney, Vinu Mankad does not warn him and runs him out at the non-strikers end. And now it is a a bit of a big deal, at least in modern day, you know, when we look at it. Back Back then, you can add to that, the press wasn't as concerned about it as perhaps people are today. So what changed... Yeah, well, I do yeah. see a trend that I've seen before. And I'll bring this up with the Bairstow incident recently, the Stuart Broadedge to slip. 
that hmm. it does feel like the people who don't cover cricket every day are the ones who are much more upset at this sort of stuff. So hardcore hmm. cricket fans, there are some hardcore cricket fans who have issues with this, but they have their own issues with it. But the hmm. people who are um, especially loud and angry about it are specifically people who are casual fans or hmm. not that invested with cricket. So they haven't seen this. They haven't seen the Bearstow run out happen before. So it hmm. must be wrong. <laughs> Whereas those of us who've covered cricket for a long time, like my first instinct was, why did he leave the crease? Hmm. Right? That's not how other people saw it. And the same with Broad. You know, I defended Broad at the time. I've seen a million people edge the ball and not walk hmm. before. Uh, are you, have you got a problem that the edge went further? The same with the Ian Bell situation where everyone was like, I can't believe Ian Bell's been run out. Well, no, no, no. Hmm. Ian Bell didn't wait to see if the boundary had been um, given. He should have been given out. Hmm. So there is... You know, when you, when you look at all those different things, I, 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 I do think that there is a difference between these two. What I found interesting was when I started to read some of the stuff, they talked about, like Bradman talked about the media whipping it up into a frenzy. Hmm. And every article I read about it was <laughs> kind of on Mancad's side. They may not have all been defending him, hmm. um, but no one was saying that what he did was outrageous, hmm. right? Some people said probably shouldn't have done it. Some other mm -hmm. people said probably should have given him a warning in that test match as well. Uh huh. Um, but you do read the former cricketers. There's, I think, D Dilip Singhi and uh, Dilip Singhi, sorry, and mm. who's the other one? Um, one of the old uh, Australian players mm -hmm. came out and said, "Shouldn't have done it. We don't like this." Blah blah blah. Right. So, but so many other cricketers, Bill O'Reilly, Don Bradmy, uh, Arthur Maley, all mm -hmm. came out and said, "No, no." The, the batter was cheating and leaving his ground. Of course, he should have been run out. And you talked about Bill Brown being a great runner between wickets. We're now no part of the reason, right? <laughs> he was taking yeah. advantage at his end. And, and so I do think that, that there was certainly a lot of pro man cad conversation at that point. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Where it's interesting you've... is why it becomes negative. And I do think mm. that the situation um, is very, very uh, unique in that the next day was a rest day. Hmm. So it happens about five minutes before stumps. Bill Brown's been run out. Then they have stumps. Then the next day's a rest day, so they've got all day to talk about it, right? Hmm. And that's when the letters to the editors start getting written, would be my guess, because no one's watching the cricket, so you might as well write a letter to your editor complaining about this mm -hmm. thing. Then the next day's washed out. Then the next day is washed out. We get a little bit of cricket on day five, and then day six is washed out as well. So you hmm. basically had a whole um, six-day period where there should have been, or oh, five-day period, uh, where there should have been cricket uh, on four of those days, and they just don't have any cricket. And so, of course, the last thing anyone remembers in that test match is going to be Bill Brown's run out. So the letters to the editor are ve not, not all of them, but are mm. very, very negative in general. And, the, and the, a lot of the press is not like that. In fact, the, the weirdest one I found, you, you talked about the, New the Bill Henley one. I just want to br mm. briefly mention that. That Bill Henley... Um, match report is one of the most detailed match reports I've ever read on a game and it's a mm -hmm. nine uh, when, when did we say it was 1865 or something mm -hmm. Otago versus Canterbury and it's like <laughs> an essay on this game right you, it's incredible how much detail is written in this game and mm. there is like four paragraphs three or four paragraphs at the top all about the weather and then a line and a half on the run out right mm. and so then when you come through to Mancat and you see all these different things about his run out there's an article in the Career Mail where mm. um, essentially, um, and that's, that's Bill Brown's local newspaper, where it not only defends Mancat, but it actually goes into the reasons why Mancat did it because they had gone to the point of asking Mancat. They didn't just say, um, you know, uh, uh, why did you do this? Can you take us specifically through what Bill, the issue you had with Bill Brown was? Not just he's leaving his crease so you ran him out. And Mancat explains it. And this is in Bill Brown's local newspaper. It's mm -hmm. incredible how smart and well covered this bit of cricket history was. And I say that as someone who has spent lifetimes going back and reading about famous incidents in newspapers and going, this is what they wrote? This is absolute horseshit, right? It wasn't the case <laughs> for Mancat. It was actually really well covered from all angles. Pro, negative, laws, um, you know, previous incidences. You know, we find out that... You know, Ian, uh, Ian and Greg Chappell's dad had done it in a club game. We get all mm. these little yeah. beautiful bits of tidbit. And Arthur Maley says, I don't even know why he gave him a warning. Should have just <laughs> run him out the first time in the tour game. Really brilliantly covered. And it's a really interesting mindset considering it becomes more controversial, I would say, mm. after that incident than it was during that incident. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And all of these names that you've mentioned, Arthur Maley, Bill O'Reilly, even the great Don Bradman, you know, years later admitted that they, he didn't really see anything wrong with that. I mean, were you a bit surprised? Of course, the Mark uh, or Martin Chappell story, I think, is great because uh, not only did he attempt that back in his day, of course, he is the father of Ian, Greg, and uh, what's the Trevor? last Chappell? Trevor Chappell, right? And then the first ODI Mancard in 1975 is orchestrated by Greg Chappell, so clearly runs in the family, right? Yeah, but, uh, run, were run you... outs in the family. <laughs> yeah. So when you were researching this, were you like a little surprised to come across these sort of reactions? Because it's not what we, you know, expect given the current climate in cricket with respect to the Mankad. Yeah, so I did a podcast with Abhishek about this for hmm. Red Inca a while back. And when I did the podcast, I assumed that what had happened is that I knew that Bill Brown had no problem. That's another important person. Bill Brown. Yeah, Bill Brown had no problem with this, right? He was like, he was disgusted at himself. Yeah, I shouldn't have kept leaving the crease, especially after Hmm. he'd done it to me twice. Um, uh, I I knew about Bill Brown and I knew that there were some Australian cricketers. It wasn't until I started going through, like I went through old newspaper reports for this, that I realized how many reports were pro Mancat. Hmm. Or, as I said, at, at the very least, even if they weren't pro, they just discussed his side of it. You know, hmm. the batter was out of his crease and he was run out. And I, when I talked to Abhishek, I assumed what had happened because of the period that it happened. It happened in hmm. 1948. And I assumed it takes a, a little while to sort of go back to England. And after World War II, we have a very pious moment in world hmm. cricket. Right, spirit of cricket becomes a big thing. Mm-hmm. You know, people are saying we should play for the for the country. You know, patriotism. You know, World War Two has just happened. All this sort of stuff. And I assumed that it was an England thing, and that the story got back to England. The name spreads around. England media start using it, and it happens. And then you go through it, and you realize that that doesn't happen, right? Mm-hmm. And that actually, what happens here is that if anything, the name sticks. Because no one had a name for it, particularly at that point. And I know we'll talk about mm-hmm. the name a little bit more later on. Yeah. But it's not that the name sticks because it was seen as a negative thing in 1948, right? Mm. It's that it happened and it had never happened in a test match before, right? Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it essentially becomes a bigger deal than it should because it happens in a test match. Just as, just as when test cricket's getting big, of course, as well. The county cricket was bigger beforehand. Mm. Test cricket is getting big. And so... When I was researching it, I expected there to be a lot more bad articles written Mm -hmm. by people. I expected that, you know, Mankad to be, how dare he do this to our glorious Mm -hmm. Australians and all that sort of stuff. And I think I underestimated how much Australians are more likely to be the perpetrators of a Mankad. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Australia have done lots of things on that sort of borderline to begin with. But also, because Australia was was running between the wickets so much, they were probably thinking more about the fact that their players were taking an advantage, right? Hmm. And it's not the reaction that I thought I would find when I went back. And it was Abhishek who really sort of started to, hmm. you know, enlighten me to the fact that it, was, it wasn't seen as this darkly negative moment of cunning Indian cricketers taking down our hero. It was more a case of, oh, Bill Brown kept stuffing up and some people are upset at the run out just because they didn't like it. And other people were like, well, Bill Brown should have stayed in his crease, mate. Yeah, no, I certainly, when I was reading your piece, I was shocked to see the reactions back in the day. And even like a couple of years later, Charlie Griffith, the West Indian, I mean, Mm -hmm. he attempted one. It wasn't a big deal. So, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one, right? And it's also interesting that you mentioned that, of course, there was rain. So people had nothing much to talk about with respect to the cricket. So they were talking about the run out of the non-strikers then and eventually it came came to be known as the Mankad. But it's interesting because the press wasn't painting him in a negative connotation as such. So it was angry fans sending letters to you know, their editors. Do you think that maybe, you know, the commercialization of the sport, and I know we're still in the 1940s, but it was bigger, you know, cricket back from, you know, compared to the 1800s. Do you think that maybe, you know, played a role with respect to this being blown out of proportion? I think it was a test match. Hmm. And I think it was a test match just after World War II when, you know, India wasn't recovering the same way some of the other countries were. But, you know, some hmm. of those other countries were recovering, right? And so hmm. sport takes a huge, you know, when, when you're going through that sort of period, as you would have seen with Pakistan over the years, you know, if you have a destabilization or a war hmm. or a famine or a whatever, you know, I don't think it's a mistake that Bradman comes out of the um, Great Depression, hmm. you know, era in Australia. These things are usually quite linked. And so... I do think that national cricket is getting bigger. Australia thinks they've got a pretty good team. This thing happens. Everyone's talking about it. But with all due respect to Thomas Barker, he didn't do it mm. at Lords. Mm. Right? Bill Henley didn't do it at Lords. I think if they'd done it at, at Lords in, in, in a players versus gentlemen game or an mm. early test match, 
I do think it would have been much more associated with them. Binu Mancad does it, you know, at a, at a proper test venue um, that gets plenty of coverage, that has agency riders that can... you got to remember, so that I follow cricket really closely, but something else I follow really cl- closely that you probably um, uh, are not as aware of, but cryptozoology hmm. is something I'm really fascinated in. And when you go back and you follow the early cryptozoology, you realize that a lot of the reason that things become big issues is because a story gets picked up on the wire and suddenly Mm. every newspaper in the world gets it. I think in Thomas Barker's um, case, I just don't think that would have got picked up on the wire. Whereas Mm. Mancad doing that to Bill Brown at an SCG test match, I do think, you know, Mm. in Sydney, in a test match, all those things mattered. And, you know, the, the early cricket stories... The reason that we have lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of mistakes is that like a wire story would go out and that would become the legend of what had happened. Um, mm. And you see it again and again. So I do think that that, that played a part. Um, and cricket was just bigger, right? Like, mm. it, you know, so it, when, it, when it was, when especially Barker, when mm. Barker was doing it, right? Cricket wasn't that big outside of England. It was just right. starting to get big in Australia. The rest of the world really didn't have a big cricket culture. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit in the USA, right? But it wasn't that big a cricket culture. Uh, if you look at Henley, he did his in New Zealand, so and they might as well mm. not have existed, Bayram. I mean, right. he, he couldn't have found a smaller audience. Like, not mm-hmm. even in Auckland or Wellington did he do it, right? <laughs> um, and, so, and so I do think all those things do play a part in it becoming a bigger deal. Um, and it's spreading quicker around the world as a, as a as an incident. Yeah, and of course there is uh, the amateur versus professional debate in all of this as well. But more interestingly, something that you pointed out is that you know a stature of Vinu Mankad, you know that sort of cricketer, he was big back in the day. He yeah. was one of India's main men. So him orchestrating the run out at the non-strikers and maybe that could also be a reason why it's it became a big talking point. You know, years later. Well, it was interesting because I didn't put this in, in, in the article or the video, but I was actually thinking of the fact that... So, you know the story about WG Grace and Sammy Jones? Do you, do you remember mm. that one? It Is came it the out one in the which be- he... Yeah, when he was yeah, gardening, came, right? Yeah, when Sammy Jones mm-hmm. went down the wicket to garden, he said he mm. looked at WG Grace, nodded his head, but walked down when the ball was live and WG Grace runs him out. My guess is that that happened a lot in cricket over the history of the game, right? Mm-hmm. But WG Grace being involved in it. Like WG Grace didn't play in every game, right? Mm. And yet so many stories about things that he did I've lived on because it was WG Grace. This is, you know, Bradman and Warren and, you know, uh, all, you know, Sobers, all these guys who, Imran Khan, all these guys who are bigger than the game have that kind of, you know, cachet, right? Mm. Like Imran Khan is... Some people still think of him about you know as the the chief of reverse swing. It took him over a decade to work it out. Like mm-hmm. there were experts around the world in reverse swing, not even just in Pakistan. By the stage Imran mm. worked it out, right? And right. but the legend sticks to them. Uh, you know, I did the um, I did the uh, knuckleball thing recently. You mm. have no idea how many articles I found that said that Zahir Khan invented the knuckleball, despite mm. the fact that it had been bowled fifteen years before him in cricket and documented, and the fact that Charles Langevelt gave it to him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the bigger players get that sort of stuff. So I do, again, if Vinu Mankad had been a guy in, from India playing his second test, who, who the, the Australian media were already writing about how good a cricketer he was before he turned up. If he hadn't destroyed England in test matches and you know, all those sorts of things, that he, especially that he would go on to do, but also mm. that he did early at, at, had already done at that stage, I do think you're right. I don't think it would have had the same impact. Right. Now, another thing that you allude to in your piece is that in the 183-year history of the Mankad, there have been phases where sometimes it, it's been out of fashion, sometimes it's been very much in fashion. And there's this one period, you know, 1979 to 1992, where you couldn't really, you know, find a Mankad. And there are instances of non-Mankads in this. Most popular one, I suppose, is the 1987 World Cup game, Pakistan versus the West Indies. The West Indies need one more wicket, and that would put them in the semi-final, and that's quite a big deal. And Courtney Walsh has the opportunity to run Salim Jaffer, you know, out at the non-striker's end, but he doesn't. Yeah. And Pakistan go on to win that game as well. Pakistan play a semi-final, lose that semi-final, different story altogether. But this period, you know, you mentioned that there were no Mankads, and then also Courtney Walsh did this huge thing which became the news, and it is probably the most popular non-Mankad story. Yeah. What's going on over there? Why is this, you know, a seasonal sort of thing with cricket? That's the thing I, I wish I could answer because hmm. 
I I would have thought that what you would get is you get a bunch of man cads up until 1890s. Hmm. And then 1890s to World War One, it's quite a romantic, you know, it's called the golden era of, of cricket. You know, it's quite a romantic, sepia-toned. I've always made fun of it because I was like, I was in a great, we just had white people playing test cricket. Um, <laughs> is it fantastic? Um <laughs> Let's let's ignore the fact that the Australian team went on strike uh, in that in that period, and that it was the ICC was formed based on a racist ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I understood them not having a lot in that era, but then I would have thought between the wars you might have got a few more coming back in, mm-hmm. and then from the early nineteen fifties they would have disappeared again, and that's not what happens. So when the spirit of cricket becomes the topic that everyone has and, you know, the, the whole discussion about that starts, really. Hmm. Um, not that it was never that far away, but there have been vif- different times. But after World War II, actually, we do have a few Mancads. As you said, you know, hmm. Mancad did it. Um, Griffith did it. You know, there's a few that go on, you know, in the 60s, the 50s, 60s, 70s. Hmm. And then you, you get to, I think, there's a huge period where there's none in first-class cricket. And there's also another huge period where there's none in any professional cricket. And that's also when white ball cricket starts. And when you would mm. think that man cads would be more a tactical reason, you know, in the death yeah. overs, it would make sense. And it does feel like for whatever reason, they start to get really frowned upon. And what I would say is this. If you, I didn't put this in the piece, but if you track it back mathematically, you said it was 1979 to 1992? 92, right? yeah. Yeah. So the MANCAD terminology starts to get used publicly between 75 and 78. Hmm. Up until that point, we did not have a name for this, right? Hmm. So when that terminology starts to get used, it means that people start ha- What could you have an opinion on before? Do you know what I mean? You would have to spend five minutes explaining it to the bloke at the pub before mm. you actually had an opinion <laughs> on it. Whereas now, right. in an instant, you could say, ah, oh, you know, those man kids, they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't exist at all. So I do think that having a term actually meant that it was a little bit more frowned upon, was easier to discuss mm. and have a short, uh, you know, in, in a very short period of time, did have an impact on it. And I think if you look from 1979 until really yearly Kartik in 2012, Hmm. they do disappear a lot and i do think it's the stigma of the name actually plays a part in it at that stage that it has a name and it can be explained instantly and it's seen as either a good thing or a bad thing there's no in between no one no one is you know it's a bit like pedophiles you're either a pedophile (laughs) right or you're or you're anti-pedophile there's no like Hmm. there's no people who are in the middle going i've got no strong opinions on pedophiles right (laughs) you you have one or the other and i think that well, the man cat is not, I don't think the people who are pro it should be seen as pedophiles or the people who are negative mm. um, about it should be seen as pedophiles. I do think it's one of those things that there is no in-between ground on. And once we have a way of dis- discussing it in a shorthand, I do mm. think for a period that the, the people who are anti, um, I almost said anti-pedophile there, the people who are anti-man cat win, win for a little while. And then eventually mm. you start to get players like Murali Karthik going, wait a minute, why should I mm. be ripped off? Because this guy's cheating. Mm. And I think, that was a way of thinking about it earlier on, and it had disappeared a little bit. Yeah, you're very right to point out that it polarizes opinion like anything, right? And off late, though, if you talk about contemporary cricket, we've seen a bunch of under-19 cricketers execute the mankad, and it seems like that whole spirit of cricket conversation doesn't reson- resonate with the youth of today. And then, of course, you've got Ravi Ashwin as the torchbearer of how the mm. mankad is a good thing to do. And then also you wrote about this Cameroonian female I forget the name, but she attempted the Mankad four times. Is it Maeve? Oh my God. Duma. Maeve Duma, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, well, she attempted it four times in a single game. And if you go back to the days of Thomas Barker, I mean, those days women didn't even play cricket. So we've come a long way. And the current lot, it seems like they're not having any of it. They're not going to let batters steal the ground. And that is the popular opinion. So do you think this time it's going to stick around or are we going to have another phase later? No, I think I think now cricket has changed to a point where mm. batters don't rule the game the way that they did mm. psychologically. We've gone past the gentleman format of the game. And I mm. think now there's too many... Every time this brought up, there are just too many people online mm. who just say, wait a minute, why is the batter allowed to cheat and the bowler's not mm. even allowed to do something legal? And I think mm. that you could... I, I can understand people... I, I had someone the other day say to me, no one goes to the ground to see man cuts. And I was like, yeah, no one goes to the ground to see wides. But if we didn't mm. have wides, cricket would be a lot shitter. 
And it's exactly yeah. the same with Mancat. If you're allowing batters to cheat over and over again, what? And, mm. and so I do think that the new generation will feel like that for a long period of time. I, I honestly think there's a changing of the guard a little bit. But I still think there's a lot of people who come through and feel uncomfortable about it. And, and I want to say this. I'm very pro Mancat. Hmm. I've used it before. I will use it again. If I play against mm. you and you leave your crease, <laughs> I will do it against you. Right? I have no will fear. Will you give me a warning? Nope. You, you, <laughs> just, I won't give you a warning when I get you out stumped either. Um, but I also do understand that not everyone has to feel that way, right? Hmm. Like, it doesn't have to be that, oh, you're with me or against me, which a lot of hmm. this discourse is. But I just think that everything, the, the conversation around this has changed so much now that I don't think we could ever go back to the days of just letting batters hmm. cheat and without anyone going, wait a minute, what? Yeah, I think you're right. And the conversation, like, regardless of which side of it you're on, it gets a bit exhausting, all the discourse around the Munkard, mm. you know? And we've seen that England more so have taken a stronger stance against the Munkard because they feel a certain way about the spirit of cricket, which was, of course, on full display during the Ashes as well and the Bairstow run out and all of that. And it's ironic, right? Because the English are the ones who have written the laws. So that's a bit all, it's all a bit farcical, you know? This thing is 183 years old. Yeah, you would have thought they would have fixed the laws by now, right? Look, yeah. that's what I've got. No, I've got... If, if you're an England fan and you're complaining about the best I run out or the man cad mm. or any of this sort of stuff, I'm sorry. I just don't give a shit. And the reason I don't... If you've got a good thing, you know, good something to add to it, that's fine. But if you're just complaining, mate, your people had the rules. You know, mm. you had the playing conditions. You had the laws. You had everything. You could have fixed this by now. Suddenly, you, you've got an issue with all these things. Um... Josh Butler was cheating, right? Hmm. Whether he did it intentionally or unintentionally, he was out of his ground while the ball was live and he got run out, right? A couple of times. He deserved to be run out. He should be run out again. Or he should put his bat back in the, in the, thing, in, in the ground. Now, if you want to get to the argument that I think it was Mitchell Stark might have said it should be a five-run penalty, I don't think hmm. that's, I don't think that's the, should be the case. And also, uh, if that's the case, I don't think... Mitchell Stark realizes how often players are out of their crease when the ball is being delivered. And if you, ha you, know, if you follow Peter Della Pena's Twitter account when he talks about mm -hmm. his man candidates, teams could be losing like 80 runs a game. Like, it's mm -hmm. no. The, I think the best way of doing it is occasionally someone getting run out um, and doing that. But what I would say is a bit like the old no balls when they weren't, when the bowlers, uh, they didn't go on the bowlers total before the free hits, especially. Penalizing a bowler one run didn't actually stop them bowling no balls. And I would say mm. that even the run out has not stopped batters leaving their crease early. And I don't think we'll ever get to a point where there'll be enough run outs that it will do that, although I'm hopeful. But the five run penalty, I just think you could have like 45 runs taken off of a team in an innings mm. um, as it currently stands. Maybe that changes uh, quite soon after. But I just, it, that to me rips at the fabric of the game more than. He was out of his crease or she was out of her, her crease and she was run out. That just makes, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I mean, and I know lots of people have lots of views on the Munkard and what, you know, penalties should look like and this and that. And honestly, like, I don't have the mental capacity to get into that debate at all because we hear too much of it already. And I don't think any of our listeners are keen on our views on that either. But there's an interesting one over here and it's the term it being called the Munkard. And yep. there have been some different views on this as well. Like Sunil Gavaskar thought it should be called the Brown, which definitely does not ring a bell. And, oh, well, this just doesn't have a ring to it. It, it does ring uh, a bell. It has because, a ring to it, but it yeah. sounds racist. So I don't think we can yeah, use it. Yeah, you've been browned. No, no, yeah. we're not having that. And, and also, you know, Venu's own son, Rahul, he has said that he doesn't like his father's name being used in a negative con connotation. But here's the interesting one. Like, lots of Munkard family members are actually really happy and they feel a great sense of pride that yep. their name has stuck around and is associated to cricket. And like you pointed, right, it's not a negative thing for everyone. A lot of people think that it's very, very valid. And so it doesn't have to be a, a, a term that has a negative connotation and it could be celebrated even, you know, it could, you could feel a certain sense of pride and you could say it with uh, a lot of joy that, oh, he's been Munkarded and I know you have lots to say on this because you've written quite a fair bit on it as well. So yeah, I guess that would be a nice place to end this ordeal. Yeah, look, I when Raul um, uh, Mancad was saying that he didn't want the family to say it, I, I understood that and I took that on board. Hmm. But I do think he came from it from the wrong angle. He came from it from hmm. the fact that Mancad, Mancad's name was, used, was being used as a negative connotation. And hmm. I never used it as a negative connotation. And I don't know if everyone in cricket even was by that point. And when you go back through mm. the history, I also don't think they were. 
In hmm. fact, I think some people were using it to say that's, that's an intelligent way of playing cricket. Like you mentioned, right, the Australian cricketers back in the day, they were the ones who were using Mankad, not the press, not anyone else. Which like, isn't... You know how we overuse baseball these days? Wasn't the case with the Mankad. No, it, it was a very generic, uh, well, generic, sorry, a very, um, uh, you know... Obscure. Yeah, it, well, <laughs> obscure is maybe the wrong way of putting it, but it, it happened naturally. Hmm. Right, it wasn't forced on by the media. It wasn't forced on even by that one event because it takes years hmm. for it to happen. But people keep referring it to it that that way because it didn't have another name. Very few things in cricket are named after players, and some of those hmm. things that have been, you know, eventually we stop referring to the players involved in them. And and I don't see this as a negative at all. Now I do mm-hmm. understand that not everyone in the Mancad family would ever agree with me from that perspective, mm-hmm. and I take their um their thing on board but what i've always said even during the height of Raul um mancad talking about this i always said the same thing if we don't talk about vinu mancad through this run out how often is he ever going to get mentioned ever again mm-hmm. right right and you go back to the start of this show and we were talking about what a fantastic cricketer he was and how his numbers don't quite show how brilliant he was when you look at them briefly and when we get to a point where Every second Indian star averages over 50 with the bat and they've won a bunch of World Cups and someone's won seven, mm. you know, IPL titles and all this. How are they going to look back at the guy who averaged 32 with the ball and 31 with the bat or whatever his numbers were, right? They're not yeah. going to think of him as a legend. This gives us a chance to at least occasionally go back and look at that career and put some respect on it, right? He's going to get forgotten. And do you know how mm. I know this, Bayram? Because I'm a cricket historian and I can tell you how many fantastic players, even better than him... No mm. longer mentioned. Just don't right. even exist in the conversation anymore, right? And so, from a cricket perspective, I come at it from that, that he deserves to ha- be kept in, in, in this conversation. Mm. And I sympathize with the people in his family that see it in a negative way. I disagree with them, but I sympathize mm-hmm. with it. I really do understand where they are coming from. But I think ultimately, the Mancad name is always going to be linked to cricket because of this wonderful cricketer who did this incredible thing. Forget, let's forget all the cricket stuff just for a moment. Hmm. He was a little known cricketer at the time. He wasn't, you know, it wasn't Don Bradman. He wasn't WG Grace. Hmm. He went to, the, to play the best cricket team in the world, right? He saw one of their players doing something and he had the courage and the conviction to not hmm. only do it once, but to do it three times to say, this man is cheating hmm. and I'm going to stop him cheating. If the Mancat family don't want to be involved with that, I don't know what to say, right? Because at a certain point, I'm like, this man is a hero. He was a, he was a really intelligent cricketer. He was an incredible player. And because of him, we have a word for this thing that is going to mm. be controversial. I, don't, mm. I think for the next 20 years, 30 years, it might be controversial, right? I don't think right. the controversy is going to go away until a very long time. You know, and if England if England stays a majority voice in cricket at times, it might it might stick around even longer than that. But the point is that he deserves his place in history the same way that when we talk about the wrongen, it's nice to occasionally mention the word bosi, hmm. right? Because it's nice to say it was invented by a dude and he did this thing. And in Vinu Mancat's case, he was the person who brought that dismissal to test cricket because he saw a batter taking advantage. And in some ways, it's as simple as that. And I know there are a lot of people that will have very, very strong opinions on everything to do with with this. But on a very, very basic level, what Vinu Mancat did was he said that when I come into bowl, I could see the batter is getting ahead of the game. It's getting in my eye line. And I Mm. made a gentlemanly warning to this person and he continued Mm -hmm. to do it and I ran him out. You cannot see anything he did as a negative. He did everything to the the letter of the law. He did everything Mm. because the player, the batter was actually upsetting him, that the batter was taking runs away from him. And he still gave a warning, right? He did everything that he needed to do. And as far as I'm concerned, he's a really important part in the history of our game. But... I also want to remember Maeve and Barker and Henley mm. and these other people because it does feel like we have had mavericks who believe a certain way. And as you said, I think eventually that is how we will think about cricket, right? And so, the, you know, the Ashwin Murali Kartik wing, mm. I think will probably get more and more ground as we go ahead. I don't know if that would happen if we weren't using the term mancat because it so mm. aptly sums up that dismissal in a way that I don't need to say run out at the non-striker's end. And I'm going to finish with one last thing, Bayram. Hmm. Run out at the non-striker's end can happen 
without it being a man cat. So that True. description still doesn't actually describe it. Mm-hmm. Whereas a man cat means something specifically. It's not written in the laws. It's a nickname mm-hmm. that I think is a folk nickname of cricket that should remain. But not everyone will agree, and that's more than fine because this isn't pedophilia, right? Yeah, it's just a legal dismissal, dismissal in cricket. Yeah, I mean, you speak about other people. I can tell you that I had an issue with this. I thought that Mankad should be renamed or whatever. I was in favor of calling it the Ashwin, but then I, you know, saw your perspective and I saw how, you know, if people in the 1940s, you know, 47, 48, they didn't give a damn about it. They didn't see this in a negative connotation. Then why should we view the Mankad as something that is a negative term? So I'm all for it. Let's celebrate Vinu Mankad. And he has that distinction that whenever a batter will be run out of the non-strikers end, people will re- remember him. And that's just one of those beautiful anecdotes of our sport, I suppose. Exactly. And yeah, pretty solid place to end this podcast. Thank you to all our listeners for tuning in. This is Behram Kazi. You can find me at Def Mango on Twitter. With me was Jared Kimber, of course. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Footmarks. That's all for this time. Goodbye.